At the University of Arizona Bio5 Institute, we are focused on tackling complex challenges such as disease, hunger, water and food safety, and other health and environmental issues facing our families, communities, and the world. Bio5 brings together hundreds of multifaceted experts that include world-class scientists, engineers, physicians, and computational researchers in a team science environment designed to creatively solve difficult problems. This approach has resulted in disease prevention strategies, promising new therapies, innovative diagnostics and devices, and improved food crops. Join us each week as we talk about science with researchers, staff, and students from the University of Arizona's Bio5 Institute. Hello and welcome to another episode of Science Talks, a conversation hosted by the University of Arizona's Bio5 Institute. My name is Sean Caden. And I'm Marissa Romero. And the Bio5 Institute is home to hundreds of researchers, as well as many administrative staff who help support the cross-disciplinary research conducted here. Today, we're joined by someone who's held multiple roles here at Bio5, Dr. Brittany Ulorn. She, is, she has been a researcher, she's one of our podcast hosts, and she's currently a coordinator of marketing and communications here at Bio5. She was originally trained as a scientist by two Bio5 researchers, Dr. Todd Vandora and Dr. Sam Campos. She earned a doctorate in cancer biology in 2020, and she's since transitioned into a career in science communication. She uses her research background to communicate and promote the research events and programs here at the Bio5 Institute to a wide variety of audiences. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Yulorn. Of course, thanks for having me. It's really exciting to be on this end as opposed to hosting or editing. So I'm really looking forward to it. So 2020 was when you got your PhD. I was like, that that's a date, that's a time frame that really pops right off the bat. There were what a few things that happening like? that year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, was, it was a challenge. Um, so, you know, obviously things started shutting down maybe around March of 2020. And that mm-hmm. was right around the time when my dissertation was due to my committee and I was wow. starting to plan my defense. And so my parents already had their um, flights booked, their hotel book. We had already picked out a place to go for dinner after my graduation. Um, and so there was just so much excitement prior to the beginning of 2020 about my defense and graduating. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, COVID happened and things started to shut down and I started to realize, oh no, I won't be defending, giving my presentation in person. I'm going to have to stop my research early. I have to transition to finishing from home. Um, It just added a whole lot more stress and emotion to an already stressful and emotional time. So it was really difficult. Um, But I think something like that was a a positive of the experience Mm -hmm. is that I was able to defend and give my presentation remotely. And I had so many more people that were able to view it, like friends and family around the country that would have never been there in person. Um, So I think that made it really special, just knowing that so many more people could actually attend, even though I was giving this Mm -hmm. talk to just my computer screen in a conference room alone with my husband. Um, a strange world. Yeah, we made the best of it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I have an early memory of you, and we talked about this uh, with Dr. Goodrum, Dr. Felicia Goodrum, uh, of having my son come to a lab tour, and you were one of the people that was talking to his group. He was in second grade at the time. He was in the second or third grade. I can't remember when, but but you were talking to this group of young, maybe potential scientists, we don't know, time will tell. Um, and I think you would ask the question, it's like, well, what do you guys wanna be when you wanna grow, when you grow up? And so I always, I always think about that. It's like, what do I wanna be when I grow up? And you've had now, you, you, you were in research, you got your PhD in cancer biology, and now you're a science communicator. So you're still in science, but it's completely different. So talk about it those two differences and maybe what you want to be when you grow up. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. I am not an adult yet. I don't feel, even though I am having a (laughs) baby soon. So I thought I'd be an adult. (laughs) Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Um, Yeah. So I think ever since I was little, I knew I wanted to be 
in science and be a scientist. Mm -hmm. And so that is the path that I followed uh, through high school, through undergrad. I got science degrees. I obviously pursued grad school in um, cancer biology and I did laboratory research. But I think during grad school, I found that while I love science and I still do, I wasn't as excited about doing my own research. I didn't see myself sitting at the bench every day for the rest of my life. I couldn't get excited about pursuing just one project or one avenue. Um, But I knew I loved talking to other people about their research. And I loved learning about so many different disciplines outside of my own wheelhouse of biology and chemistry. And so I think that's why I transitioned into science communication is because I can still be at the cutting edge of science and of research. I'm still reading about it and writing about it and interacting with researchers but I'm not doing my own research. And so the two roles in, you know, in its essence are very different because one is doing research. The other is writing about research. Um, But I also see them to be very similar in their methodology. So um, for those of you who are familiar with the scientific method, right, you follow this process with, you have a, you have a question and a hypothesis, and then you do your methods and your experiment and you get your results and you write up your conclusions. And everybody really understands how that works with science or experiments, even if you just do that in grade school. Um, But it also kind of works that way when I'm writing a story. I have a topic I want to write about. I have an idea where I think that that story might go. And then I got to collect my background research. Um, My quote unquote experiments might be interviewing researchers, students, um, program, you know, coordinators and things like that. And then I take all the pieces, so all my data, and I kind of see what the best story is going to be. How do these all fit together? What's What's the picture that I want to paint here for the people that will be reading whatever it is I'm writing um, and then write that up and write a story. So that's one part of my job um, that I see that really aligns with kind of my scientific bench science training. So it's been a really good fit. Right. Definitely. And the fact that you know yourself and you could see your self-transitioning into a role that is still scientific, but in a unique way. I think not a lot of people understand and know about that world, which is super important because not only is the actual bench scientific research important to evolve our world, um, having people there to communicate it to a general population, that's just as important. So um, yeah. Yeah, and, just kind uh, of, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, no, it's okay. Oh, I was just thinking, um, I realized Sean asked me at the end what I want to do when I grow up. And I think that, (laughs) Marissa, what you were saying made me think about it a lot is, um, you know, I'm not really sure. Maybe one day I might want to go back to the bench. Maybe I want to stay in science communication. But I think what is so important is that I found that there are avenues outside of research. I think that's something that's so important for undergrads and grad students to learn is that if you pursue a science degree, that doesn't mean you have to stay as a traditional scientist. There's nothing wrong with that if you wanna do that. Perhaps I'll go back to that one day. But I think it's important to know that there are other options like communication and marketing and policy and education um, that you really can find a fit for yourself given the training that you've had as a scientist. So what the future holds for me, I'm not sure. Um, but I know right that's now okay. it, it will de- yeah, it's okay. It'll definitely be something in science and I'm, I'm starting to embrace, yeah, the unknown, um, and just see where life takes me. Cause it's been fun so far. So I'm excited mm-hmm. to see where the, what the future holds. <laughs> that's great. And I think you touched on an important part, offering that advice to our younger generations, because a lot of people are intimidated by that and uh, are kind of afraid to go off this straightforward path, but that's often where you learn the most and grow and find yourself. Um, so to kind of touch on that a little bit, you it sounds like through your journey, you've had a lot of spectacular mentors, people who have taught you. So I was wondering if you could speak to the importance of mentorship, both in being mentored and um, being a mentor to others and why you would encourage anyone really to seek out that in their lives. Definitely. Yeah. Mentorship has played both being a mentor and being a mentee has played such an important role in my life, both personally and professionally. I have found through my experiences that 
you know, I think we create community through sharing our stories, um, both Definitely. the good and the bad. Uh, and so it's been important to me as I've progressed through school and, you know, just now a little over a year into my professional career um, to have mentors, to bounce ideas off of, to say, hey, I'm not really sure what I want to do. Or do you have any people that you can connect me with that, you know, might be able to help me with this if you are not able to help me? Um, I think that's really beneficial to just use them as a resource. And I find that most people are really willing to help and sit down with you. Um, and, you know, they'll tell you, this is what I've been through. This was my journey. Um, but I think it's also important as the mentee to not feel the need to follow in the exact path of your mentor, right? To take mm -hmm. that advice, but take the advice of multiple mentors and create your own path. Um, and then Absolutely. for me, as being on the other side, being a mentor, I have just loved the opportunity to help, um, whether it be undergraduates when I was a grad student to teach them, um, how to do science, how to apply what they were learning in the textbook. I think that's been a ton of fun. Um, but I've also just enjoyed mentoring people more so, I guess, in the personal professional connection, I would say. So not just thinking about, okay, what is the career I want and what are the degrees that I need to get there? But thinking more about like, how does this fit in what I want for my life? How does this support my mental and emotional and physical health? Um, because that's been something that's been really important to me. And so I really like showing people that your career is not just your job. It's going to affect all of these aspects of your life. So it's important to, for, to me to teach the people that I mentor that. So yeah, mentorship be aware of that. Just, exactly. I think it's essential. I think you're never too, I mean, granted, I'm um, still very young in my career, but I don't ever yeah. see myself not having a mentor. I don't ever think you're too old to have a mentor. Um, I think you can always learn something from other people. Yeah, and I think you've touched on a couple of things. It's this journey of, you know, we have Discover Bio 5 in our background. It's like this journey of discovery is, is about also about discovering how you kind of fit into where you want to go. Uh, one of the things that people may not know is that you're, you've become a self-taught expert editor of these podcasts and, and you've jumped in and you've hosted the podcasts on, on several occasions. And it's, you know, to see Brittany, who I remember from the lab, and then Brittany now who's hosting podcasts, it's, it's just in the short time that I've known you, it's, it's quite an evolution. So, so well done, Brittany. Thank you. Well, I mean, like you said, I, when I uh, um, started this job back in April of 2020, right after I finished my degree, I was not envisioning that I would be working on videos or podcasts or websites. Um, but I have learned and yeah, I've used my resources. I've sought out people who could help me with these skills and give me a place to start. Um, so I think it's all about, you know, using your resources and then also just trial and error um, and knowing that you're not going to get it perfect the first or second or maybe even the third time you may not ever ever get it perfect because I don't think we ever can achieve perfection but it's just about it's striving for it yeah yes. yeah and that's what's so exciting about life is you don't know what the future holds it's so unknown and so I relate a lot to you in that way because I never thought I'd be here doing this right now or editing and mm -hmm. in the role I'm in now. So that's super awesome. <laughs> I do want to take you back to your research days. Mm -hmm. So, so what, one of the things I'm, I'm fascinated by as a, as a writer, I, I've, uh, I've, I've done some theater, I've written some of my own monologues, Ooh. uh, uh, this was a lifetime ago, but it, but I, I do really it enjoy the, the, it did happen. I have witnesses. <laughs> uh, I do really enjoy the writing aspect of, of what you do. So talk about like the genesis of ideas. So, so you're a researcher and you know, what fascinates you. Um, it, does that, how does that factor into when you talk, when you, when you pitch a story that you would like to write about or, or you, you, uh, you're talking to a researcher and you're like, I, I've got to ask him this question because that question is, is something that's really been kind of a thought in your mind. Talk, talk about that process a little bit. Yeah, I think I have a unique perspective on this, right? Because I'm mm -hmm. a former researcher 
And now I write about science and I talk to researchers, but I write about it for lay audiences. Mm -hmm. So when I was a researcher- thank you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We all need it. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I mean, I even know when I was um, in grad school, if I read something that was in just a slightly different field, there's no way that I could have understood it, even though I was in science. And um, so, yeah, I think it's important. But so as a researcher, most of us are writing for our specific group, right? We're using very heavy jargon language that only the people in our field can understand. And that's important for science, um, but that's not accessible to the general public at all, let alone people outside of your field. And so now as a science communicator, when I'm thinking about, okay, what is it that I want to write about? um, I like to think about the big kind of questions in the world, right? The big scientific mysteries or the biggest challenges, whether that be in health or the environment or things like that, because that's the stuff that people really care about, right? Um, So that's what they want to hear about. They want to know what researchers are doing to tackle cancer, to tackle food sustainability and things like that. And then when I'm going to talk to a researcher, I will read their primary research papers. I'll try to understand the science. Um, But I think what's important is asking those bigger picture questions to the researcher from when I'm interviewing them. Um, Ask them where, how do you, would you see this impact the world or your field? Or what was so novel about what your group did versus what everybody, all of these other scientists have done in the past? What makes your study unique? Um, Because I think it's pulling out those, those bigger puzzle pieces Um, that make the science more digestible and understandable and relatable. And so that's kind of the approach I take. And then when I'm writing, I always try to think of it as a story or a narrative. So if there's a really cool human component, I love bringing that in. So for example, one of the stories that I wrote that I really still like um, was about this student researcher who was collecting patient samples from COVID patients in the hospital. And she was telling me this story about how she was just so impacted by seeing someone on a ventilator. Um, And so I think it can be really neat to start a story like that, to bring readers into this visual, to this experience and show them this human, humanized impact of um, this really specific and complicated research that this student was doing. Um, And yeah, just, just trying to stay as broad as possible, but not compromising the science because what the researchers do is incredible and it's detailed and it takes years and years and I never want to discredit that or you know to water that down but Mm -hmm. it's important to know who your audience is when you're writing. Well and and researchers can get into the weeds really quickly we've interviewed a couple of people and and you gave me really good advice kind of early on to try to keep it try to keep it in language that people can understand and, and not just assume that everybody knows what a mass spec is or, or any kind of particular area of research that they may not know exactly how it could impact them. And I've seen a bunch of researchers do this really, really well that talks about why is this important? Uh, so it's, it's it, the pragmatic approach has a has a general appeal that I think is, is really important, but also, hey, I can shift gears and get back into deep science if we want to. Uh, and then a whole bunch of us would probably leave the room because it's like, I have nothing to add at this point. I can help you with the elevator speech. You know, we talk about this from a researcher perspective. It's like, all right, you need to sell me on the idea of this research from, from the first floor to the fourth floor. You have that amount of time to sell me on the idea that this research is important. And how do you do that? Because a lot of researchers have a hard time with that. And, mm-hmm. and you, in your transition from researcher to science communicator, that could be a future job for you to help them with, uh, <laughs> with getting, getting that understanding, getting that kind of broad appeal and putting it into terms that more people can understand. Definitely. Making it relatable and finding that emotional mm-hmm. connection in a sense, I feel like it's so important for our world moving forward. Great. Uh, So I am going to kind of change gears a little bit. And uh, in a previous interview I actually conducted with you, I recall that you told me that something others might not know about you is that you love cooking, you love trying out new recipes, and that you actually had a desire, a goal in your life to either 
make a cookbook of some sort or like a food blog. Uh, mm-hmm. So I was curious if you, which I, I totally relate. I love cooking and maybe <laughs> after this we can exchange some recipes, but um, so I wanted to kind of follow back with you to see if you've made any progress on that or if that's still a goal of yours or if not, I guess, what is your new passion outside of work? Oh my goodness. Yes, that is so true. I absolutely (laughs) love cooking and baking. Um, It's so funny. I remember when I was a little kid, my mom, when I started to get old enough to be able to be around the stove and knives, um, my mom started to get me to cook. So every Thursday night in the summer, I had to make dinner and I hated it at the time. I hated being in the kitchen. I hated touching raw meat. Um, I just, I didn't want to be there, but In college, when I finally got out of the dorms and I was living um, in an apartment, I found this love and this passion for cooking. And I realized, okay, I have very few recipes in my wheelhouse. I think I was rotating between like three things and I got bored (laughs) very fast. Um, But I remember going to restaurants and being amazed at the variety on the menus. And so that kind of inspired me to get more creative in the kitchen. And so, yeah, I found this love for for just trying new recipes and then creating my own. And have I written this cookbook yet? No. Um, <laughs> Maybe that's your next step. <laughs> that's my next step. I know. I realized oh. things have gotten just so busy. Um, but no, I would love, I think it'd be so fun to do that. Cause I do keep all my favorite recipes. I have them, I hand write them and I keep them in this really awful folder that has been just covered in water at times. I think we all have one of yeah. those. Yes. <laughs> That's been passed it's, down. Yeah. Yeah. From I love it. I should just make something out of it. I think that would be a ton of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that'll be my, uh, on, on the things to do in the next five, 10 years, maybe. Nice. <laughs> awesome. And cooking well, is definitely a science in my opinion, but yeah. I think so. I have found, so. especially with like baking, there is just if you tweak something really essential, you know, you know, when it goes wrong, Mm. Uh, the scientific method is subtly (laughs) embedded in there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Nice. Well, we've, we've jumped to a couple potential future careers for you. Hopefully, hopefully not anytime real soon, or you can do it in addition to all the stuff you do here at bio (laughs) five. So, so as you see from our banners, uh, we are entering into 20 years uh, with the Bio5 Institute that we've been, we've been in business. Talk about Bio5 as an organization since you, I mean, you seem ideally placed because you've been part of a couple different parts of the Bio5 organization. Talk about Bio5 and its impact on you and why you think it's important. I think for me, you're right. I've been with Bio5 for, let me think, almost 20, no, 20, 10, 10 years now, <laughs> 10 um, years, since 2012, uh-huh. um, when I started my research in undergrad, and then now, um, as the science communicator for bio five. And even though I've had different roles over the years, bio five has really taught me a lot about mm-hmm. collaboration and opportunity. Um, in research, you know, when I was both in undergrad and in grad school, I, just saw how Bio5 brought my PI together with so many other faculty members um, in different different in different disciplines. So in my undergrad, I worked with Dr. Vanderaa in the Department of Pharmacology, and I was able to work on projects in so many other fields like neurology um, and cancer biology. And so that was fascinating just to see how Bio5 brought those researchers together. Very similar experience in grad school, collaborating with Sam Campos, my PI, um, and Dr. Conrad Van Dorslayer. Um, also just seeing all of the different core resources that we have um, that I was able to take advantage of. So I think we really support our research here at Bio5, but there is so much opportunity for growth. So I have felt as a former student, um, that I had all this training and this expertise around me that could mentor me and help me become the scientist that I wanted to become. And then even when I knew I was transitioning into communication, there were times during grad school where I came and I talked to Lisa Romero, who is now my boss. And I said, Hey, I'm thinking I want to go into communication. Tell me a bit about what you do. Do you have any opportunities for me just to write something here and there? So I think the the environment at Bio5 is so supportive to its students, its researchers, its staff, um, and they really give you whatever tools that you need, whether that is a physical tool or more of an intellectual tool, 
um, to help you succeed personally and professionally. So Bio5 has been pretty great to me and I'm just so excited to be continuing here um, and now in this role and to be able to show off to all of our different audiences how wonderful um, this institute is. That's and a pretty good sales pitch. Yeah, we got to write that down. Get a quote. Yeah. Good, good thing we've got it recorded, right? So, yeah. It's definitely a unique community. Very special. You can't really find it anywhere else. So, yeah. Oh, and that was what you're saying too about community is that's something I'd love so much when I was in grad school working in the Keating building is just even the layout of mm -hmm. our lab spaces in Bio5. It's so collaborative. You have those lab bays that are open and I could pop over to Dr. Felicia Goodrum's lab next door or um, you know, who also worked on viruses, which is what I worked on, or I could go to a lab that worked in drug discovery if um, I was interested in testing some compounds in my research. Um, and then even just the cubicle area, like we're always, this just this open environment where we can share ideas, laugh, eat together. Um, and so I think, yeah, it, it's also just a really cool physical space that fosters community and collaboration. And ho hopefully we get back to that. I, I know it's, it feels like a long time. I, I feel like a common theme with all the researchers that I talk to is I want to see you in three dimensions soon. So uh, <laughs> we do appreciate these opportunities to have podcasts and be able to share our message with a broader audience. But um, being back in, in three dimensions would be really, really nice. So we're, we're, we're cautiously optimistic that that will happen <laughs> sooner. <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Marissa, you have any other questions for Brittany? Mm -hmm. um, I think just if there was anything else you could give to any kind of audience, what your one piece of advice would be for now, uh, considering the world we're in, how we've made some progression from your experience, what would that be? For me, I think these past few years have really been a lot of self-discovery and learning how to take care of myself and learning how or what I want in life, right? And how I've kind of grew up as a people pleaser, like a perfectionist. And I think a lot of us just kind of live similar lives where a lot of us are very type A, um, we're really trying hard for something, but I'm not sure we really know who we are. And I think especially the pandemic has really brought into perspective um, the things that we sometimes take for granted and kind of how we can sometimes not take care of ourselves as well or take care of the ones around us as well as maybe we should be. So I think it's important at times to take a step back and really check in with yourself and check in with those people who are, you know, kind of in your bubble, in your, in your inner circle, whether that's your family or your close friends and just, you know, see how is everyone doing and how am I doing myself? Um, and yeah. what do I need to do in my life to better support myself and better support the ones that I love? Because then I find that when I'm better taking care of myself, then I can be a better employee, a better wife, a better friend. Um, and so I think that's really, really important to always remember to take care of yourself. Um, yeah. It's okay to put your life on pause for a little bit. Uh, definitely. And recollect and see what you want out of yourself in your life and support those around you. I think that's Most really important. important. Well, this has been a pleasure having you on and yes. it's, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to at some point again, uh, interviewing people with you, Brittany, I always appreciate your, your perspective. Uh, and do you have any questions for us? I always yeah. like to throw those out there every once in a while. Hmm. I don't know. What, uh, what, what have you two learned over the past year? What's like your biggest takeaway from 2020 through early 2021. I'm not as technologically challenged as I thought I was. <laughs> Same. I, 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 I have to say this because uh, Marissa may remember, I don't think you would know, Brittany, but I used to have this dumb phone and it was like, yes. And, and it was like an archaic phone that everyone used to laugh at me. Always tease him. <laughs> oh yeah. We used to have like uh, little kids, you know, I was a basketball coach and little kids would look at the phone and was like, that's your phone. And they're like eight oh, years no. old and they have better phones than I do. Um, so now I have a smartphone. I canceled cable. 
Uh, we don't have a landline anymore. What? I know it is. It is incredible. You know, that's that's <laughs> a lot for a period of a year. I think it took a global pandemic to to force me to kind of join the modern age. I was uh, just going to say, wow, <laughs> if it takes that, I don't know yep. if we're ever going to get you. Anywhere uh, else. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I may have this iPhone for a while, I, I, uh, but but I, I will say in all seriousness, uh, being able to step back and reflect on what's important mm -hmm. uh, and the people that are important to me, and, um, it has been, it's a good reminder. I mean, we always think, oh yeah, we appreciate the people we appreciate, but you know, it's, it's okay to tell them that. And yeah. uh, I've, I've been doing a better job about telling the people I care about that I care about them. And uh, I think that that's a, that's an important step forward for me, for sure. And for me, I think definitely that has played a very important role to me over this last year and showed me what I need to do moving forward. But I think also a note is that you always hear, don't fear change, embrace it. And I think after this year, we had a perfect example of how you should really not fear change and embrace it and seek out every new opportunity, every new connection you make um, to dabble in things you never thought you would be interested in. Because again, that's how you will learn. That's how you will grow uh, personally, professionally, intellectually and you can help change the world around you, so. Yeah, I love that, yeah, change is, it's very scary, um, mm -hmm. but it can be so rewarding um, once you get over the difficulties, it's, it really can bring a lot to your life, so I'm glad you yeah. found that. <laughs> Thank you, I'm glad we all did. Yes, and I was gonna say, it's like, if, like if, we all did. <laughs> if, if, if you weren't embracing change, you wouldn't have realized how much you love cooking, so that's, yeah. uh, you exactly. Know, I look forward. I look forward to seeing your cookbook. Uh, put it. Put it right. Right beside the joy of cooking. Joy of cooking. And... In my uh, dedication, I'll make sure to dedicate it to you too. And oh, thank you for there we oh. go. Oh, the the inspiration started on podcast. Yeah. It's like, hey, I, I think everyone has at least one good book in them. So, mm -hmm. uh, and and some people may have multiple ones, but at least one. Yeah. <laughs> and that's so, yours. So. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Lauren. I really appreciate it. And it's been a pleasure uh, hosting podcasts with you. Hopefully we'll get to do that again real soon. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us here at, the, uh, at Science Talks and look forward to seeing you at future episodes of Science Talks. For more information on the Bio5 Institute, please check out our website at bio5.org. And from all of us here at the Bio5 Institute, thank you for joining us to our audience for tuning in to another episode of Science Talks. Continue the conversation with us next time as we learn more about the science happening at the University of Arizona's Bio5 Institute.